Web 2.0. Innovation. Trend. Collaboration. Software. Software. Got the world turning as fast as it can? Hear how technology can help, legally speaking, with two of the top legal technology experts, authors, and lawyers, Dennis Kennedy and Tom Mile. Welcome to the Kennedy Mile Report here on the Legal Talk Network. And welcome to episode 248 of the Kennedy Mile Report. I'm Dennis Kennedy in Ann Arbor. And I'm Tom Mile in Dallas. Before we get started, we'd like to thank our sponsor. And that would be ServeNow, a nationwide network of trusted, pre-screened process servers. Work with the most professional process servers who have experience with high-volume serves, embrace technology, and understand the litigation process. Visit ServeNow.com to learn more. And we also want to mention that the second edition of our book, The Lawyer's Guide to Collaboration Tools and Technologies, is available on Amazon. Everybody agrees that collaboration is essential in today's world, but knowing the right tools and strategies to use them will make all the difference. In our last episode, we discussed my new book, Successful Innovation Outcomes in Law. I'm gratified already by the response to the book. Um, it's available on Amazon, in paperback, or Kindle. In this episode, Tom and I were both at the recent Association of Corporate Counsel annual meeting in Phoenix. We thought we should compare notes and focus a bit on legal technology and the practice of law from the corporate counsel perspective and how customer insights can benefit everyone who delivers legal services. Tom, what What's all on our agenda for this episode? Well, Dennis, in this edition of the Kennedy Mile Report, we will indeed be discussing our, uh, our respective experiences at the ACC annual meeting and what we learned about the perspectives and priorities of in-house counsel. In our second segment, goodness help us all, I'll help Dennis get set up to get up to speed on his new Google Home Mini, which actually has a different name, and we'll talk about that. And as usual, we'll finish up with our parting shots. That one tip website, or observation that you can start using the second that this podcast is over. Uh, but first up, uh, the recent Association of Corporate Counsel annual meeting, uh, which was in Phoenix this year, and uh, and what we learned there. Uh, I've been attending the conference for a number of years. Um, uh, my company is both a sponsor and an exhibitor uh, in the vendor hall, um, and I am an occasional speaker there. As one of the thing, one of the nice things we get as a sponsorship is we also get to, to speak, and so I've spoken there the past few years. Dennis, you've been a longtime member of ACC, um, but you haven't been to the conference recently. Maybe um, you could give our listeners a little bit background about the ACC. Yeah, if you're an in-house counsel, the Association of Corporate Counsel, or as we like to call it ACC, um, is really an essential association to to belong to. It is uh, uh, really the gathering place for corporate counsel. It's, it's where you get uh, education, networking. Uh, it has a great system of local chapters. So I was in the, the St. Louis chapter, um, which uh, was, has won awards as being one of the best uh, chapters. In, in the country, and I'll be switching over to the to the Michigan uh, chapter. Um, so it's a it's just a great resource for the the corporate council and their their needs and their concerns and uh, and the interesting and it really helps you as you you take into account the role of corporate council, which is uh, this interesting place where you are both delivering legal services and a lot of times cons a consumer of legal services. So uh, first time, actually, time it's the first time I've been to the to the annual meeting itself. Uh, so so that was that was fun to. Do but that's that's my uh, glowingly positive uh, review of ACC, which is uh, uh, I've uh, totally enjoyed all the time that I've been uh, in the ACC. Well, and and I can't speak to ACC as a member because as uh, I've never been in house counsel, so I don't qualify. I mean, my experience with ACC has really been through our involvement. My company, like I said, is a sponsor of the um, Information Governance Network. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the network structure that they have at ACC in just a minute. Um, but um, I I have to say that of all the conferences I attend, um, I'm so impressed with ACC in terms of the number of people that come out, 
how energized they are, um, what I think is actually really pretty good content for the most part. I mean, I think with every conference, you're going to have some hits and misses, but um, I, I think that the intentions are good, that they try to present some good content, and I think they really are hitting on the issues that corporate counsel really need to talk about. I know, Dennis, you kind of want to talk a little bit more about the technology side of it and things, but there's so much more that goes on at ACC that because we're really, you know, we're, we're, we're talking talking about people who uh, they have one client and they have to serve that client. And, 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 and w what's interesting about that is, is that you've got to serve them in so many different areas. It's not just like having a practice in one particular concentration. It's about having to learn about so many other different types of law um, and to, to be able to serve your client, especially in the area or industry that they're in. Um, it's it's hard to get that kind of information, and I think that that both the way you describe it, the the network structure of, of the the individual chapter groups, they sponsored parties throughout the whole thing. The chapters did. Um, they had a big lunch the second day where all the different regions got to sit together. Um, so it's I think it's a I think it's a, a must join organization if you happen to be working in-house. I just think it makes a lot of sense to be a part of it, even if you don't go to the meeting, to take advantage of all the tremendous resources that they've got. Well, and it uh, it reminded me a lot time of uh, ABA Tech Show in that there was um, – ACC is great about uh, taking care of its its members. Uh, sometimes my only criticism sometimes is that they protect you so much as a a member, like from people trying to sell to you and and reach out to you. That uh, you, you know sometimes that can be a little tiny bit of a hindrance. But most of the time, I even appreciate that. But it reminded me of Tech Show because people who come there are, as you said, they're really interested in education. They want to be there. The uh, the sessions were were jam packed, um, and so um, there is a real strong focus on on CLE. I guess what I also noticed, Tom, and maybe you can verify this, but people were telling me that this is really it's been a really recent development that they've had uh, law firms uh, on the exhibit floor because because usually um, in the past you you didn't see very much of that because like I said it was so geared to to the in-house counsel so that was that was interesting because I think that in, in many cases or in most cases the in-house counselors are the major buyers of services from the larger law firms and so that uh, we'll touch on this I think in this podcast we, we talked about in the past time how uh, the in-house counsel on the buyer side may be able to drive technology and innovation in in ways that uh, the law firms uh, need to get ready for well, I, and I think that is a, a, a big differentiator. Well, I don't want to say it's a differentiator for Tech Show uh, versus ACC, but but one of the things that I notice, I mean, to be honest, I spend a lot of time with my company in the in the vendor hall, so I see how the lawyers um, interact in the vendor hall, and um, they have budget. They have decision-making power. They have responsibilities, and I there are so many that come by our booth that are walking through and it's very clear that they have an agenda in the vendor hall. They need to get certain things done for their company for which vendors have to help them. And um, so the, they they come in with a list of, I need to go and look at, we'll talk about some of these later. We I need to look at contract management. I might need to hire a firm who can handle my employment law stuff because I'm looking for somebody different. Or I'm, I'm looking for information governance services. And they come in with specific needs, um, which is similar to Tech Show. I've seen lots of lawyers who come in with with very specific needs, but I really feel like it's more pronounced at ACC because they they kind of have an idea what their priorities are. Um, they I, I, I sort of feel like they're a little more up on it than than the average lawyer is uh, who comes into Tech Show. Not exactly sure what to see, especially the new folks to to, to Tech Show kind of come in and are all uh, overwhelmed with what they're seeing. Um, at 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 ACC, I think most of the attendees are pretty are pretty savvy and they they know what to look for and they ask a lot of really good questions as far as I'm concerned. 
Yeah, I'd, I met a lot of great people, so it was really fun that way. I think the other thing that's interesting, even if you don't go and you're a, a lawyer in private practice, or, or even if uh, if you're in-house as well, it's, it's a great way to see what issues that corporate counsel are prioritizing these days. So just looking down the, the sessions will will give you a sense of, of the things that are either hot issues or, or that uh, people are really focused on these days. And so, Tom, from, from your perspective, Perspective. I did want to ask one question that that I saw is uh, is this California data privacy law big or what? Um, you know, it's interesting. It it is, but it isn't. So if you go and look at the agenda, um, there really was only two programs that mentioned it. One of them was put on by my company, but um, but there was only one other session that talked about it. But we had so many people who came by the booth that said, I need to think about it. I need to get a handle on it. And and the session that we had, like you said, you saw packed rooms. We did too. We had over 400 people come to see the session on California privacy. So it's it's a huge it's a, it's a huge topic. But what I really like about ACC is, uh, and, and they've kind of changed it a little bit. Um, they have have sort of a little bit moved away from the track notion um, and they've kind of divided up their sessions based on uh, they've organized their agenda either based on the network um, the, the the different the ACC is is broken down into different types of networks um, and which I I sort of feel like they are a lot like the practice groups you might find in your average big firm so there's one for corporate and securities there's one for employment and labor there's an energy network there's an environmental sustainability network there's a financial services network. You know, the networks that I identify the most with are information governance, IT privacy, and e-commerce. Um, and then law department management has its own network. Um, so you can, when you were, at, if you were there at the conference, you could say, I want to see the sessions that apply to my network. And you'd be able to look at those and, and, and sign up for them. But you could also go by topics. And the topics were a little more varied than that. You had business and leadership and career development and Again, contract drafting, huge thing going on at, 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 at ACC, and that's really an every year thing. Um, corporate governance, data privacy and security, um, which which there was not a ton on California, but there was a ton on data privacy um, as a general broad topic. Uh, government regulation, legal operations, one, one session on social media, um, and then a lot of stuff on technology. So... Um, there's a lot for everyone, depending on what your focus is, what your interest is, what your priorities um, for your for for your law department happen to be. Um, I just I think it's well rounded. I thought uh, I thought the the program, you know, whether the sessions themselves turned out to be uh, satisfactory for the people who attended them, I thought that the program itself was very well rounded. Yeah, so I I was uh, on a press pass for this one, so I, I learned by wandering around. And, and what you said about the tracks is really interesting because you could it seemed there were, let's say, seven or more sessions going on at any given time. So it's really kind of, you do have to make choices and, and navigate, but I think it, it, you're right. It is geared toward those those networks in ACC. And so there's it's, it's a thoughtful uh, or uh, way to organize things. Things, um, but it for me it was like it made it a little bit harder to to sample things, and you know I ask you the question about the California data privacy law time in part because I just kept running into people who asked me what I thought about it, and uh, I gave them my usual radical opinion about that. But uh, but I was surprised by the number of people came up, and I think I saw a bit more of it maybe on the the exhibit floor and the conversations I had than than. Even the even you saw, so um, that was interesting. So I went there. Tom, I my main thing was I was trying to figure out what was going on in the world of innovation, uh, either in law firms or in the corporate legal department. So um, I got some sense of that, but I that was mainly from digging around and, and talking to people because it wasn't really there wasn't a track devoted to that. Although as as you said, Tom, there's definitely some stuff on technology and sessions on AI and stuff. But it gave me uh, a sense of what people are looking for and especially what law firms felt that they needed to provide. So that was that was one of my things. So I, I uh, you know, learned a little bit there. 
that was good, uh, but it but it took some work to do that. But if you had asked me what the one topic was that was totally front and center in so many ways on the exhibit floor is is contract management. And I'm guessing, Tom, since there were a number of contract management companies right near your booth that you might have observed the same thing. Always big at ACC. There are always... Um uh, in fact, in fact, if I had to, I didn't count this year, but if I had, if I had to guess, I would say that if you look in the vendor hall, there's not a ton of actual. Dennis, you walked around. You can tell me. I didn't spend as much time walking around, but but I, I would guess that there's not a ton of technology vendors out there, unless they're selling like a research service or some type of online service for you to buy. Um, I'll talk a little bit about document management in a little bit, which I. <laughs> fairly strongly against it in a law department, and we'll talk about my radical opinion there in a minute. But, um, but you know, the booth right next to us was, a, I think, a pretty brand new contract management thing that they brought 14 people with them dressed in superhero costumes for two straight days. And uh, um, I think contract management is a huge thing. Um, I, I will say with every client we work with, um, the law department wants to know about better ways to manage their contracts. And um, I think that's a huge thing, and it was definitely reflected in the vendor hall this year. And, and, and definitely cloud services as well. So I think the, the lawyers who are reluctant to move toward the, the cloud might be surprised at how prevalent uh, you know, cloud-based tools. And, and I know, of, I mean, I'm guessing the document management company that you're going to talk about, but it's definitely cloud-based tools well. Well, I think, well. I think that, I think that, um, in-house counsel are more readily, um, they're more readily accepting of the cloud um, than regular law firms are, um, mostly because the company's IT department leads them in that direction, and they don't really have a a, 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 a choice but to follow on that. And, uh, uh, you know, so many departments in a corporation are starting to use cloud-based tools. The HR department in most companies, most of the tools they use are now outsourced, and they're either cloud-based or third-party tools. So um, it's almost impossible to, to run a company these days without using them. So I think that that in terms of use of cloud, cloud tools and in acceptance of them, and I think there were a couple of sessions this year on, on you know, risk management around cloud tools, not really talking about should we use them or not, but it's you are using them. Now let's manage them the right way, which frankly is the way I think we should have been dealing with it for a long time now. Maybe like 20 years. The uh, Yeah, and, so, and I think uh, yeah, a lot of the corporate environments are using tools like Salesforce as a, as a primary example. So it's just, uh, you know, part of the the, the bread and butter. So Tom, right. what were you, what's your, the, your radical thoughts on document management that you wanted to mention? Well, so, I mean, I think you put a, uh, a, a line in our kind of rundown for the show to talk about, and, and I may be jumping the gun a little bit here, but a focus on small law department tech. Um, in my opinion, looking at the sessions that focused on technology, I would say that if there were any themes, it was about one, contracting, and two, a lot, a lot, a lot of artificial intelligence, a lot of things on AI. Um, but I have two things to say about it. One, this is not a technology conference, so there's not going to be a ton of technology content, although I was kind of pleasantly surprised at, at the volume that there was. But two, my opinion is, is that focusing on small law department tech is like saying that a law department is like a law firm inside of a company with its own technology. And I think that there are some pieces of technology that only law departments use, like contract software, like e-discovery and litigation case management tools, those types of things. Um, I think law departments are smarter that think more corporate in their technology purchases, which is why I also think you don't see a ton of technology vendors at the conference. And, and I've always been of the opinion that although law departments in corporations have always been more forward thinking in moving to document management for their own law department. I ultimately think that it is a mistake for them to be separate from the rest of the company in their document management 
solution and say, well, the rest of the company is on Office 365, but we're using our own little thing that we have internally. Um, I think that's a mistake from a corporate perspective, um, because I think that um, having consistency, being able to collaborate, not having silos is really a more important thing when you're in the corporate environment than when you're in a law firm. So I think that, you know, d d document management solutions for law departments, I, I, I know that there's some out there. I like the tools a lot for lawyers in general. I just think that they're the wrong fit for most corporate law departments because I think that that l those law departments, whether you're small or large, no matter how big the corporation is, you should be thinking about overall corporate consistency. This may surprise you, Tom, but I, I really agree with you on that, that uh, you know, having these little silos uh, is not a great idea. On the other hand, I did notice in conversations that uh, this is also a world where people want to use software tools, cloud tools that are, are sort of branded as corporate law department tools. So um, I was at uh, an, another event at the same time um, and talking to, to a number of people about technology. And it was uh, it's striking to me that in the corporate counsel world, people will, when I ask them what they want, they basically are describing the standard small firm practice management software, which I think would give them 90% plus of what they need on your day-to-day -day work. I've said this for many years. Now, you don't want that to become its own silo for the, the reasons that Tom said, but for a lot of these things of just tracking what you're doing and, and just helping you in your day-to-day -day work, they're, I think they're, they would do the job very well, but I think people get hung up on the fact that, because I've had this conversation many times where people would say, no, that's for solos and smalls. I'm, I'm like a corporate counsel. So in a way, you kind of, it was interesting to me how, see how on some of these things you just have to step back a little bit. I did want to say, Tom, that I, I talked to a number of the, the law firms who were there because I was asking about innovation. And so it's always been a kind of running joke, that, you know, that there's, you know, however many number of big law firms there are in the world, they're all like full service general practice firms. And they, they, they will fight to the death to tell you that they do they do everything. Sort of the same thing in innovation when I ask people about that. Yes, they're doing innovation. And I ask them if it's all centralized in, in one place. And they go, no, we do it everywhere. And, you know, we, we do everything. And, uh, you know, so, so that was interesting to kind of dig down. It reminded me of the early days of e-discovery when, when people would tell you that. And you have to dig down and say, okay, tell me what it is, what you do that's best. So um, some interesting observations for me is innovation is located in different places. Sometimes it comes out of the knowledge management group. Sometimes it comes out of an IT group. Sometimes out of business development or a, a certain practice area. And there is uh, definitely a focus on uh, what I would call apps, uh, which may not I, I don't think especially means mobile apps, but uh, but definitely sort of focused tools to provide um, to clients. Uh, so so that was an interesting thing. And then I don't know, Tom, as as we wrap up, I guess that I do want to get your thought of uh, about AI and uh, how it seems like every every technology we hear about or what people are doing there say we also throw in a little bit of AI and. Uh, you know, uh, I'm just not sure where AI is these days. I mean, there's definitely stuff happening. I just don't know that uh, it still f feels like there's a bit of overpromise there. Right? So I don't know what your if you uh, developed any opinions from things you saw there. Well, I didn't really get a chance to see that much to form a good opinion about your specific question. I think I will say in general that in-house counsel – not necessarily unlike other lawyers, but I think in-house counsel who, um, you know, they have a mandate, you know, as we know, in the law department, you are a cost center. You are not a profit or revenue generator in a 
in a corporate environment. And so saving on costs, being as efficient as you can um, is the goal, is a goal or the goal that most law departments will have. And if the promise of artificial intelligence is to simplify or to get you to, to get you to decisions faster or to save you money because you're you're using AI to uh, use uh, computer learning on your documents for e-discovery, then that's something that's going to be powerfully attractive to in-house counsel. And so I think that's one reason why we saw so much of it um, at the at the conference is it's it's the promise of simplifying, um, saving money. Um, making them more efficient, bringing them in under budget, that sort of thing. Whether they can, these tools can deliver on that promise, I think uh, is a discussion for another day as far as I'm concerned. Well, I think it's also about keeping up with the, the pace of change or the accelerating pace of change as, as companies move, uh, uh, start to think of themselves more as technology companies, as platform companies. I, I think as a lawyer, you really have to start to move quickly. Um, and so any help you can get is good. I mean, I'll, I'll wrap up with my, I, I just thought it was a, a, a really good conference. Uh, my experience was great. Uh, met great people, had great conversations, learned some new stuff. We even uh, met a few podcast listeners. So um, all in all, big thumbs up for me and, and uh, getting to hang out with you in person, Tom. Always a big plus. Likewise for me. Uh, before we move on to our next segment, let's take a break for a quick message from our sponsor. Looking for a process server you can trust? ServeNow.com is a nationwide network of local pre-screened process servers. ServeNow works with the most professional process servers in the industry. Connecting your firm with process servers who embrace technology, have experience with high volume serves, and understand the litigation process and rules of properly effectuating service. Find a pre-screened process server today. Visit www.servenow.com. And now let's get back to the Kennedy Mile Report. I'm Tom Mile. And I'm Dennis Kennedy. As a premium Spotify subscriber, I recently was given a Google Home Mini, or at least that's what I thought I was given until I learned at the beginning of the podcast, maybe I'm calling it by the wrong name. But since Tom is the ultimate Google fanboy, I decided it actually made no sense for me to try to, to learn how to use the device on my own when I could uh, talk to Tom as the expert. So in this segment, we'll get Tom's best tips and answers to my dumb questions about uh, the Google Home world. And I'm sure Tom will tell me how lucky I am to finally get into the Google Home uh, uh, platform and uh, what I should do uh on it, given that I'm still planning to stay in the Amazon Echo world. Uh, so I guess my question time is, um, should Google Home device be for me or should it be for my wife? Well, like you said, let's get the terminology straight. You may have actually received a mini from Spotify, but at their announcement this past month, they've rebranded. And so for those of you who are looking to go out and buy something, now you're going to want to buy the Google Nest Mini. They have moved, they, they bought the company Nest within the past year or so, and they're rebranding all of their home products as Nest products. So the Google Nest Mini is what, if you're really interested in getting it, is what you want to look at. But second... Let's approach this from our jobs to be done, your typical jobs to be done question mark, if, uh, question point. If you plan to stay in the Amazon Echo world, I don't get why you're even setting up the mini unless you want to play around with it, experiment with it, and then say thank you very much and pack it up in its box and go back to the Echo. Um, I, I think... I think whichever tool you like the most, I would settle on one or the other. Go all in. I mean, they both have a lot of the same features and capabilities, and I think that if you're going to stick with one, you should stick with one and not have both of them. I, I had that for a while. I had Echoes and, and Googles in my Google devices in, and I ultimately went to Google because I happened to think that the Google devices – are smarter. They can answer more questions. I think they're more helpful. Um, but it's definitely a matter of opinion and experience. I don't think you go wrong with either device. And so I, you, you say that I'm going to answer your dumb questions. I mean, I can give tons of tips, but I don't know if you want to start out with questions first or if you want me to kind of give you my best practices or what do you want to do? Well, 
as I listen to you, I almost think I should uh, could should give the the Google device to to someone else. But but I think our idea was that um, it would just go into a separate room, and it probably it would be used primarily to to play music on, uh, not which I guess is probably what Spotify intended. Um, so there was that notion to say, well, it's just going to be a separate device, separate room. Does that make sense, or do you still uh, gravitate no, back toward? No, it, 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 it makes sense, but I don't have a lot of advice to offer. I mean, I mean, if, if I'm setting up a Google Home for the first time, um, the first thing you need to do is download the Google Home app, and which no, no, no irony at all here that it's still called Google Home. I don't know if the app will mm-hmm. be changed to Google Nest, but it's the Home app. Um, and that's what you use to configure your settings. And the settings that you would configure, it, it, for example, could include, you can set up voice phone numbers so you can make phone calls from it, um, setting up a shopping list so you can add things to your shopping list, configuring the services you use to listen to music. So Spotify, you could do that. You could set up one of any of, of about four or five. Um, I have my daily briefing set up, so I basically tell it to play my daily briefing, and it plays in a row about five different recordings of different news services that I want to listen to. Um, one of the new features that I really like is you can create a reminder for other people in the house so you can say, hey, have so-and-so remember to pick up the dry cleaning after work or something like that. Um, and then the other thing I like about the home is... Um, the ability to set what they call routines. So you can actually start a routine by just saying one thing to it. For example, you can say good morning to your device in the morning and it will turn on your lights, it'll take your phone off do not disturb, it'll tell you about the weather, it'll tell you what your commute looks like if you have one, it'll give you any reminders that you have, and then it will play your news that you set up. Um, or you can configure it to play the latest podcast, or the latest episode of any podcast you want. And I. I set mine up the other day to see if it worked to play the latest episode of the Kennedy Mile Report, and sure enough, it will play the latest episode of the Kennedy Mile Report. But those are some of the things that I would do if I was setting it up. I would go in and configure it to to get to the right places. But um, if you're testing it out, uh, I would go in and look at those settings and see if there's anything that appeals to you um, and just play around with it. So there is the Google Home app. But there's also the Google Assistant app, and it seems like you you use both with the device. Is that right? No. The well, yes and no. The 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 Google Home app includes the Google Assistant settings. So the settings you want to 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 configure with Google Home are with are part of the Assistant settings that are built into the Google. Um, the, the Google Home app. The Google Assistant app that you would download, I'm assuming, for your iPhone are really to ask it questions like to, to, to it's 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 like Siri or it's like Alexa, but it's the, it's just an app for that. If you want to configure it for the device, you want to access there are specific assistant settings within the Google Home app that contain all those configurations that I just mentioned. That's what I'm that's where you get to them from. Okay, and so the so the one thing I'm struggling with right now is that I would like to just have the the Google device show up on my Bluetooth list just like my Amazon Echo and then throw my music to it. And um, it's just not showing up. And then with the Echo, I can just say like, hey, connect to my iPhone and it, it does that. And when I try that with the Google device, it, it didn't seem to do that. It seemed really flummoxed. So am I, I assume I'm doing something wrong, but uh, do you have any tips for that? Um, my only tip is is that you actually set that up ahead of time so it's always connected. So my phone is always connected to all of my Google devices, but I can't just tell it on a whim to, oh, by the way, connect to it. Um, I mean, it's the these devices are designed to work on their own without your phone, um, but they can work with your phone too, but I would set that up ahead of time. So when you say it makes it sound like you're kind of doing it just kind of ad hoc, um, I don't really think about it that way. And so I, I, I prefer to have it all set up ahead of time. Hmm, well, just because that's interesting. Because for me, it's you know, with my iPhone, I might want to put the music through the Echo. I definitely want to put it through AirPods. I might put it through another headphone. I have like a uh, like a sleep mask with uh, Bluetooth speakers. Um, and so to me, it's just like it would be like another outlet. But it sounds like 
maybe that's not exactly the way it works. Well, I mean, I, I mean, so I don't want to go to belabor this point, but I mean, if I'm going up to my Google device, I'm going to say, hey, and I'm going to say, play this song or play, you know, BBC World Service, and it, and the Google device is going to play it automatically. I don't have to run it through my phone or run it through anything else. It's just automatically going to play. So maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're asking. For. Oh, no. So it, no, it does that, but it's, I'm using it like what you would think of as a Bluetooth speaker. So I'm sitting at the iPhone, and I say, oh, here's – I have Spotify open on the – the iPhone, and that's where I'm playing it. So I don't say anything to to the Google Home uh, device or to uh, or to my Amazon Echo. I just throw the output from my phone over there, um, and that's what I like to do. Well, that's but, that's more of a connection between the app that you're using on your phone and the device. And I will do that occasionally. I'll go onto my phone and I'll say, "I, I now want you to play it on this device." And I put more blame on that on, for example, the Spotify app, but it really depends on how it's all connected up. Okay. So I think that for uh, the price of free, I mean, it's uh, even if I turn out not using it very much, it seems like a, a good thing for me to have picked up, right? I think I think any device, Google's a great device, Echoes are great devices. Um, I think they're all great to have to, to test out. Um, you do want to go into your privacy settings and make sure that you know how to delete stuff or how to tell it what to record and what not to record and what to keep, or at least educate yourself on what it's recording so that you're not shocked and amazed that sun, suddenly it's recording everything and saying it all back to the Google or Amazon mothership. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, we're all sort of making our own compromises on that one. Uh, so anyway, it's time for our parting shots. Tom, that one tip, website, or observation you can use the second this podcast ends. Tom, take it away. So this week was the Microsoft uh, Ignite conference, and there were a ton of really exciting announcements from Microsoft World. Believe it or not, um, there were a bunch of announcements around Teams that I was really excited about. But the one that really captured a lot of people's minds was the announcement that the, the OneNote for the desktop application is back. Last year, Microsoft announced that the desktop version of OneNote, they were only going into maintenance mode. They weren't going to develop it for it anymore. And, and really, people should move over to the Windows 10, kind of the app version of OneNote. And there was a huge cry of, of, of misery and anguish from this. And uh, so at the conference this year, they've come back and they have announced, you, you know what, we're going to bring it back. It's so much more full featured than the Windows 10 app. I'm excited to go back and use it again. What is unclear at this time is what they're going to do with the Windows 10 app. Are they going to get rid of that now that uh, that people have demanded that the other one come back? But uh, if you were if you have used the, the the desktop app in the past and you've given it up or looking at looking for a new uh, note taking app, that new OneNote desktop uh, or not the new one, but the, the, they're going to be adding new features to it and supporting it again. So I would definitely give it a look. It's free to use. And is that uh, going to be on the Mac as well? Everywhere. You know? it's, an, it's, right. an, it's an everywhere device. So I have uh, two quick ones. Uh, so one is uh, been getting a great response to the 57 tips for successful innovation outcomes in law, free PDF download that I've made available. Uh, so that's also been gratifying to me. But uh, just go to my website. Uh, you'll see a, a, a place on the the right end of the top menu and you can go get yourself a, a free pdf uh, with those 57 tips and then i was ex experimenting i was look so i was looking at these little services i call them microservices that allow uh, artists and other other people to get paid small amounts and so the one that people might be most uh, familiar with is one called patreon uh, so I looked into that, and it was not exactly what I wanted, but I had seen a couple of uh, people I know use a service called Buy Me a Coffee. So it's buymeacoffee.com, and it's, it's essentially a tip jar uh, application. So uh, you can you get a link, you put it up on your website, you get yourself an account. Uh, you're, it sort of works through 
Stripe or PayPal. And then somebody who likes something you're doing, say they like your blog post or something that you make available to, for download, they click on it and they can buy you a coffee or two, which is like $3 to $5. And then every now and then you get an email saying somebody bought you a a cup of coffee and you get, uh, you know, three bucks. Uh, so, um, in, in the days when you think nobody's reading your stuff or appreciating it, uh, just to get like a little email with $3 to buy you a coffee is, is kind of a cool thing. And so that wraps it up for this edition of the Kennedy Ma Report. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Uh, we're still working on our show notes issue. Uh, we should have that back up and running, hopefully, in the near future. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to our podcast in iTunes or on the Legal Talk Network site, where you can find archives of all of our previous podcasts with transcripts. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can always reach out to us on LinkedIn. Or remember, we love getting voicemails. The number there is 720-441-6820. So until the next podcast, I'm Tom Mile. And I'm Dennis Kennedy. And you've been listening to the Kennedy Mile Report, a podcast on legal technology with an internet focus. If you like what you heard today, please rate us in Apple Podcasts. And we'll see you next time for another episode of the Kennedy Mile Report on the Legal Talk Network. Thanks for listening to the Kennedy Mile Report. Check out Dennis and Tom's book, The Lawyer's Guide to Collaboration Tools and Technologies, Smart Ways to Work Together, from ABA Books or Amazon. And join us every other week for another edition of the Kennedy Mile Report, only on the Legal Talk Network.